How many people really like surprises? <laughs> you guys like surprises? Like, what are you gonna do? Nothing. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> But, uh, you know, some surprises, yeah. You know, I remember a surprise, probably one of the more surprising moments of my life. I was just newly turned 20 years old. I was a youth director and I just had a big school bus, 89 passenger uh, school bus that I just dropped off a, a, just a bunch of kids from a summer camp. It was a hot summer August day, uh, over 100 degrees down there in Southern Oregon. I think it was about 109 that day. And, I remember just thinking, oh, I'm just exhausted. You know, after, it was a fun trip, but I just dropped the last kids off and I was alone in the bus just driving along and I was driving through the thriving metropolis of Jacksonville, Oregon. <laughs> when, uh, as I was just leaving town, there was that one final stop and I stopped at the stop sign and then I heard my emergency door buzzer go off. Now that was normal when the kids were in there because you know, remember the kids in the back always kind of playing with the levers like, eh, 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 okay guys, come on now. You know, that whole thing, the bus driver thing. Well, uh, this time there were no children on the bus. So I thought, that's odd. So I looked in my mirror only to find at that time a very young, crazy Tad Slaughter <laughs> jumping in the back of my school bus. Um, and I saw his car sitting in the middle of the road in the city of Jacksonville and he just jumped on my bus. But see, I knew that there was trouble looming because Tad was known for those kinds of events, you know, that, um, that you just didn't, well, he just didn't just jump in the back of your bus for no reason. So I did what any normal 20-year-old would do. I put the pedal to the metal, man, and started tearing out of Jacksonville. I know this is not responsible, but it was, it was an empty school bus at least. Um, and I was racing up Highway 238 thinking, what am I gonna do? And Tad came up and he started trying to grab the keys out of the ignition of the bus. And I kept pushing him and trying to steer, you know, and this whole thing. And I thought, oh man, this is bad. I, I, I probably gotta pull over because uh, it's kind of hard to drive and push Tad off at the same time. So I, I pulled over. Now, in the back of my mind, I, I was thinking, this is it for you see. It was the week before I was about to be married to my lovely wife, Debbie, in holy matrimony. And I thought, this is, oh no, you know, uh, this is probably it. And sure enough, as I pulled the bus over, like 30 cars were behind us following, all of which I recognize as my, what I once called friends, uh, <laughs> uh, pulling in behind this bus. And one of my buddies, Steve Hopkins, who was a police officer at the time, uh, he was in the group as well with his handcuffs and you know, running up to the bus. I thought, oh man, this is bad. So, so I pulled the bus off and, and just bailed out. I opened the passenger door, just bailed off and, and started running. But there were already guys there waiting and it was just a big pile in the ditch. Uh, they, they piled on me and handcuffed me and um, tied my feet and duct taped my legs from my toes up to my you know, nose. I was in duct tape. And then they put a, a wool dress on me. This was before cross-dressing was a thing. Uh, um, it didn't mean the same thing back then. But, um, but I was, so I was in this big wool dress and 109 degrees duct taped to my nose and uh, with handcuffs. And, and um, they were really nice though. They put the keys to the handcuffs to my shoelaces on my tennis shoes and then duct taped over those. And then uh, poured a bunch of Coke and dirt and stuff on me and thought it was funny, threw me in the back of a truck and then took me down to the Rogue Valley Mall there in Medford, Oregon. And they hauled me into the mall in that sort of cocoon-like state with duct tape and a dress and Coke and dirt. And, and they took me to the elevator and put me in the elevator and just stuck me in the corner. And there I was laying in the elevator. And, um, and shoppers were coming and going and they'd get in the elevator and they'd look at me and, and then up and down I went and people were just kind of like, hmm. And then they'd just go keep shopping. It was so weird. Finally, the security came in the, and they said, you know, you can't be here. You, you're not supposed to be here. And I was like, mm, mm. you know. Um, so they finally helped me get undone, the, 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 um, the mall security. And um, they said, we want the names of every person who's done this. And I said, gladly, uh, where's your notepad, you know? Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give them all. Uh, and so, uh, so just as I was about ready to give names, this is no, the, the police officers, Steve Hopkins, he had two young daughters at the time and his wife. Well, he came walking by in the mall with shopping bags and his lovely wife under his arm and his two cute little daughters and they come walking up and, and, and I said, that's one of them, that's one of them right there. And they're like, we want the real people who did this too, you know? <laughs> like, 
no. And, and Steve walks up, what happened to this poor young man? You know, Steve was acting all, you know, oh my goodness. And they didn't believe me. I was like, no, that, that's one of the guys. And, um, and he just kind of walked off with his family and uh, poor crazy man, you know. And, uh, um, but, but that, you know, that was a surprise in the afternoon. Uh, that wasn't an everyday occurrence as they, you know, they were getting me hazed as they, now that was a good thing because afterwards they took me and we actually had more of a spiritually rich time of prayer and uh, some of my buddies and we got ready, you know, and it was that way. But in those days you could do that without getting arrested. Today I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but, um, but all that to say, uh, I'm not a big fan of surprises. I, I kind of like to know when something's coming. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and because of that, I, I think it's interesting because as a Bible student, one of the things the Lord tells us is, I don't want you to be surprised. That's kind of the, one of the themes of the, the last days scenarios. I don't think we're supposed to be shocked by the rapture of the church or the, the second coming of Christ or any of the events that's gonna happen. We as uh, believers uh, should be not Tourists going, wow, what's that? Woo, what's going on? Ah, no, we're the tour guides. No, over here on the right, you have the rapture of the church. Over here on the left, you have the, you know, the uh, tribulation period. We're the ones who are guiding through it because, because you are children of the light, First Thessalonian says, not children of the night or the, uh, you know, of being drunk at night, uh, but sober, children of the day, of the light, watching, waiting, ready. You know the times and the seasons. You don't know the day or the hour when these things happen but you will start to see the times and the seasons. And that's one of the themes and really one of the major objectives, I think, of Matthew 24 is to prepare um, not only us, the Gentile church, but maybe even more importantly, to equip the Jews to understand what's happening. But here's what's interesting. Um, Matthew 24 is for the Jews, but it's, it's a sort of a time release passage. Do the, the, do the Jews care about Matthew chapter 24 today? Not in the slightest. But I have a hunch Matthew chapter 24 is gonna mean everything to them during what is called the tribulation period. Because Jesus is explaining, here's what's gonna happen to you, the Jews. And we're gonna see that as we continue our study through this chapter. Uh, Matthew 24, uh, we've, we've already done, I think this is our fifth teaching, uh, because we started... Um, two Sundays ago with an introduction to Matthew 24. And then we did Wednesday night, verses one through 14, last Wednesday. And then on Sunday, we did another perspective on 24. And we talked about the various views of eschatology and how that applies a bit to um, Matthew 24. We talked about premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism, pre-trib, post-trib, um, mid-trib, pre-wrath. We, we went over all that on Sunday. If you missed that, um, I just kind of gave a description of what the various views uh, are, which helps us understand maybe the controversy that is found here in Matthew 24. And so then we uh, also talked on Friday night about Matthew 24 as it relates to the world theme that Jesus, he, you know, on Wednesday night we went over all the things. Jesus said, look for these things. Watch, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places, which by the way, we should be praying for our brothers and sisters in Turkey, Syria. That, that uh, earthquake over there was horrific. Um, uh, last I heard this afternoon was uh, more than 11,000 dead uh, in that earthquake over there. And it's funny because nobody's really talking about it. At least I, I've noticed the news is shockingly silent. It's, it was a big deal. Um, and it always is amazing to me as we're going through the Bible and I just mentioned last week, well, you know, there's earthquakes in, in the world, but um, the key is to watch for the diverse places. And then suddenly in Turkey, there's this horrible, horrible earthquake. These are all signs of the times. I believe we're supposed to sit up, take note, and realize, wow, could this be the day that the Lord is talking about, or at least the season or the times uh, of what we're supposed to be watching for. So all that to say, um, you know, we're, we're uh, not children of the darkness, we're children of the light. Uh, one of the rapture scriptures that I love is um, that scripture um, that uh, talks about how in a twinkling of an eye, we will um, be changed, transformed. Um, that's kind of a cool thing. In fact, you can jot this down in your notes. It's actually 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Um, I love this first verse. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We have that hanging in our nursery uh, in the <laughs> babies. Uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Um, that's a little out of context, but it's 
kind of cute nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, we, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. And it says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It sounds similar to 1 Thessalonians 4. If you remember verse 17, we talked about this last week, the rapture of the church. Um, but I like this twinkling of an eye thing because um, the idea is something that you know science actually knows about and has measured. Do you know how fast the twinkling of an eye is? Um, you could look this up. In the, the, it's called the corneal reflex, also known as, as the blink reflex. Um, or eyelid reflex. It's when somebody scares you, bah, and suddenly you're like, your eye, you just kind of quick blink. That blink, as it turns out, they've measured it's, it's average uh, 0 0.1 second is how fast you can blink your eye, or in the, that's the idea of this, in the twinkling of an eye. Um, and the twinkling of an eye, in, in Bible times, that was like the fastest thing you could ever think about. There was nothing faster, really, than the blink of an eye. Just, um, uh, and that, a blink of an eye, when you just think about how quick you can blink, um, that's how fast we're gonna be changed. The rapture of the church is gonna be boom. And it's just, it's not gonna be like, whoa, we're going through there. No, I think it's gonna be boom. And you're there with the Lord uh, in the twinkling of an eye. Um, I, I look forward to that and we'll be changed, it says, in the last trump, incorruptible. The, the idea of incorruptible, our bodies are corruptible, uh, decaying, dying, um, but we're gonna be raised incorruptible, eternal, uh, and be with the Lord and we'll be changed forevermore from that day forward. And, and so we, we as Christians really look forward to this, the rapture of the church. But Matthew chapter 24 is largely about a time you and I won't be uh, a part of. Um, because, uh, because we're gonna be taken up in the rapture of the church. You say, well, Brett, there's other views on that. Well, you must've missed last Sunday because we went over all that. So pick up our teaching from last Sunday or go online, watch that. But um, uh, like I said, I believe in a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial timeline of events. Um, and we went over this on Sunday. Um, and, uh, and, and I believe this is the most uh, simple view. If you're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the Bible, this is the one that fits with all the, the um, you know, scriptures. And it's not hard to teach. Uh, any of the other views, in my opinion, this is probably one of my main reasons for being pre-tribulational, pre-millennials. I wanna be able to teach the Bible from cover to cover without being extremely embarrassed trying to fit something into something that doesn't work. Because um, I think people are smart. I think they can sense when you're trying to cram something in or trying to make something work. And uh, to, to me, the other views, you have to kind of cram uh, those views into certain passages. It's easy to have another view if you don't have to teach those other passages and you'll avoid those teachings. Um, I, I always marvel at the, the, the lack of teaching of the book of Revelation particularly because the book of Revelation, as like the preterist believes, it's all history. There's nothing there that's futuristic. It's all something that's happened in the first century. Um, and so it's all history. So they really don't spend a lot of time. A lot of preterists and preterist churches and pastors, um, they won't teach the book of Revelation because they think, oh, what a waste of time, it's just history. Meanwhile, it's the only book of the Bible that says the people who read this book particularly will be particularly blessed. And uh, here we are as an Athey Creeker church and, and we talk about the book of Revelation all the time and uh, we're just blessed by God's grace. Um, people, uh, you might note something, you know, since the, the last four, three or four years, have you noticed how many churches, so sadly, this breaks my heart to see churches that are failing, um, closing their doors, trying to keep their doors open because people have left and not come back. Um, and, uh, and I say this humbly because, you know, we're not any better than any of those churches or, um, you know, I would say a lot of those churches are probably better than we are in so many ways. But the one thing that I would say is um, there's a couple attributes of, of churches that are just booming. Like what's the difference between the church that's booming right now versus the churches that are really struggling? And they're ascribing all kinds of reasons why, you know, because of the economy and because of this and that. And, and I'm not sure they're tapping into the real reason. Um, I, I would say there's two main things that they may want to look at. One, people are starving right now for truth. People are starving for truth. And where do you find the truth? 
You find it in the word of God. You gotta make the word of God your main thing. Just focus on the word, the word, not your opinions, not what the world's talking about or wokeism or what's popular or relevant. Relevance has killed the church because the church tries to be relevant and in so doing, they become irrelevant. If you wanna be relevant, shockingly, you just talk about the Bible. Uh, as it turns out, the Bible remains relevant after 2,000 years, it's incredible how relevant the word of God is. Um, have you ever noticed that as we're just going through the Bible verse by verse, um, how you just go, man, that, like, that could have been written today for me personally. Uh, and not a lot of things have changed since the Bible days. Uh, and it's amazing to me how relevant the word of God is. So that's the first thing. The word, the word, the word. People are starving for truth. If you want your church to th thrive and flourish, people are starving for truth. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is people are wondering what's going on in the world. And there's a lot of people freaking out. What's going on? And I think they're curious and, and even troubled by these things. But then if you read your Bible, Jesus says stuff like, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in also in me. In my Father's house, in many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's called the rapture of the church, by the way. Uh, I will come again and receive you unto myself. We meet him in the air. You see, and then, and then Bible prophecy tells us more about the coming of the Lord, the, the rapture of the church, which is not a coming, it's a meeting. We meet him in the air. There's only two comings. The first coming, Jesus born in Bethlehem. The second coming, the uh, second coming of Jesus, which I believe is gonna be at the end of the tribulation, the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Um, the, uh, the second coming of Jesus. Uh, and, and, and people are curious, what in the world's going on? And why is the world going nuts? And there's a lot of people that are troubled by the world events. And I've noticed another attribute of the churches that are flourishing right now are the churches that are willing to say, thus saith the word of God. <laughs> Here's what the scriptures say about the days we're living. And man, the Bible has a lot to say about the days we're living. And, and I find great peace and solidity and a sure foundation um, that makes me realize, oh, things aren't falling apart. They're actually falling into place exactly like God said it would. And it gives me great peace to know that God is in control. Even though humanity is spiraling out of control and there's all kinds of things that would normally cause you great consternation. You know, the deceit and lies and deception that you see today, like that's dizzying how much deception's going on today. And the Bible says, yeah, in the last days there'll be deception, lots of it. And we go, oh, well, this is exactly what the Lord said would happen. So I find great peace and comfort as I study the scriptures and including the talking of, of the last days, end times Bible prophecy. So if you're watching out there and you're a pastor and you're wondering uh, how to maybe um, help really encourage people in the days we're living, the word, the word, the word, and including the, the whole word, the one fourth of this book that is Bible prophecy and not neglecting that and not allowing your congregation to miss the, the blessing of knowing what, what the world is, what's gonna happen in the world. So um, back to our Matthew 24, in this end times timeline, a lot of Matthew 24 is dealing with that red section of our timeline, the tribulation period. Where are we gonna be uh, during the tribulation? I believe we're gonna be up in heaven with the Lord, the marriage feast of the Lamb with the Lord. Um, and that's an interesting uh, talk because, um, you know, being with the Lord is gonna take us outside of our laws of time and space and physics. Um, people forget this, that God exists outside of time and space and the laws of physics. There's mysterious passages, uh, what is it, e Ecclesiastes 3.15, that says, you know, things that already have happened have not yet been. And the things that have not yet been have already happened with the Lord. Um, the Lord knows the beginning from the end. He knows the future. He already knows it. But you know the things which were past are already future. Like there's these mysterious things about time and space that the Lord talks about. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years with the Lord is as a day. Well, which one is it? Yes. Um, it, it means you're gonna be outside of time. So isn't that interesting? The rapture of the church, then we're where? With the Lord and a day with the Lord is a thousand years. So, you know, meanwhile, back on earth, uh, you know, back at the hall of justice, uh, the tribulation period is gonna be going for seven years. 
But it makes me wonder how long are we gonna be with the Lord? Um, Cause you might say, we'll be there seven years. And that would actually fit the Jewish wedding and all the, the bride chamber. And there's a whole nother discussion there that we can get into. But, um, but it's interesting to me that, uh, but that could even be a strange thing. It could be 7,000 years uh, in heaven with the Lord before the second coming. Um, who knows? Uh, I don't know those things, but I do believe that uh, being with the Lord is gonna change the whole thing as far as time and space, the laws of physics, all that stuff. I mean, there's so much about that we could talk about. Um, have you ever thought about like, when I die and pass away, I'll finally see you know, my uncle who died, you know, um, or my grandmother, or you know, the person I loved, or my dog, Fido, or whatever. I'll see them, and they've been waiting for me in heaven. But could it be that when you die and get to heaven, that you're all getting there at the same time? Time? Because in heaven, you're outside of time and space. Um, is there, are there people weeping in heaven saying, I just, I'm gonna wait till my beloved comes up here. I'll just strum a harp on a cloud uh, until they get here. Uh, no, the strumming harps on clouds, that's, you've been watching a little too, bug, too much Bugs Bunny Roadrunner show. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's not what you're gonna be doing in heaven. But could it be uh, that because of the eternal now is, is kind of the theology of, of uh, what, the time and space in heaven. Could it be that we all sort of are in heaven at the same existence and time? Um, that starts to make your brain short circuit. But don't forget, um, that's gonna be something you gotta kind of factor in and that will factor in on some of our discussions in the future. But, but meanwhile, back on, on earth here, uh, the tribulation period is largely what um, Matthew 24 is about. And so we're gonna kind of continue our study there. Um, so uh, let's get to it. Matthew 24, uh, and, uh, and, and, and let me remind you um, the first couple sections. Uh, the first section we sort of labeled verses one through 14, the end times as it relates to the nations. Um, and I'm gonna say, but especially the Jews. Um, and then the second section is verses 15 through 36, which is the end times as it relates to Israel. And then I mentioned quickly, the last section perhaps is the end times as it relates to the church. But I want you to put a question mark there. Uh, I've got some stuff I'm gonna share next week that's gonna be uh, a little different than maybe what I've shared uh, 15 years ago <laughs> in the last time I talked through this. I did mention some things that were kind of controversial last time I went through this, if, if you were here 15 years ago. But um, one of the things I love about Bible prophecy, unlike the rest of theology, all of theology is solid, locked in. If it's new, it's not true. I love that about theology. But when it comes to eschatology, the study of end times, I think we're figuring stuff out as we get closer to the end. And there's a, a whole understanding of that. The, the, but what is the fig tree? And who are the people walking in the field? One disappears there in the later part of Matthew 24. And the other guy's standing there in the field. Um, and uh, some of you might just say, well, that's the rapture of the church. Well, don't be so quick on that one. Uh, and there's gonna be st some stuff we'll talk about next week. So s some would say the, the last section, you know, verses 37 through 42 uh, is the, the, the end times as it relates to the church. Um, but it could be that it's relation to the Jew. In fact, some argue um, that the whole chapter 24 of Matthew is for the Jews and the Jews alone. And, um, and I, I'm gonna say I understand that argument and I'll show you why next week. Um, but we can be sure that this, particularly this section, verses 15 uh, through 36, is the Lord talking to the Jews. We can be for sure about that one. So this is, this is the easy part right here. Next week, it'll be a little more tricky. Who is the Lord talking to there? And we'll, we'll do some deep dive in that next week. But uh, let's, let's kind of take on section, uh, this next section. Um, the first section was the end times that relates to the nations, the, the, the things that lead up to uh, the, the second coming, the tribulation period, wars and rumors of wars. But this is not the end, Jesus said. They're, these are only the beginning. Remember the Greek word odin, birth pains that are gonna be signs of the coming attractions. But well into this now, by, by, by the time we get to verse 15, Jesus shifts gears and starts talking about the abomination of desolation. And if you recall, that's what we studied on Sunday, the middle of the seven year period called the tribulation. We know where that's at. And again, if you miss Sunday, I'm, you know, you're gonna be missing a piece that I, we're just assuming tonight. The abomination of desolation is perhaps the one thing we know where it's gonna be and what it's gonna be. It's gonna be in the very middle of a seven year period called the tribulation period. Three and a half years, first half, 
then the abomination of desolation in three and a half years. The book of Revelation says 42 months uh, or 1,260 days using the, the 130 day uh, lunar calendar of the Jews. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's um, very clear when this is gonna be. And that's what Jesus um, starts talking about in our discussion tonight. So we pick it up, verse 15. It says, um, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of uh, by the prophet Daniel, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Um, now this is interesting because, um, uh, you know, who, who's gonna read this, let him understand? That means it's gonna take some, a little bit of work and, that's, and hopefully we did that work on Sunday. If you're reading this, hopefully you understand this. Well, why would we understand? How do we understand? Go back to the book of Daniel. Jesus refers to that, even as the prophet Daniel spoke of this abomination of desolation. And you'll see in your marginal reference there, probably Daniel chapter nine. You'll also see Daniel chapter uh, 11, because it talks about the same thing. And also Daniel chapter 12 uh, is also a, a section that deals with all this stuff that Jesus is talking about, Daniel the prophet spoke of. And it's been rightly said for you that are into studying these things, um, you gotta study Daniel and Revelation really uh, together. Uh, to do one without the other, you're gonna miss all kinds of puzzle pieces. Have you ever tried to solve a puzzle with half the pieces missing? Um, that's a little difficult. Uh, and there's huge gaps and you're like, where does this piece go? Um, but I'd say Daniel and Revelation are the two major things that put all the pieces together. Uh, Walverd, and his, I think he even wrote a book called Daniel, The Key That Locks, Unlocks the Book of Revelation, uh, which uh, I love Walverd, by the way, if you're studying, looking for good study material, Walverd's done some really good work. Um, Thomas Ice is one of my favorites. There's a lot of great, um, you know, end times eschatology uh, people that write these things. But all that to say, it takes some work. Whoso readeth, let him understand. You gotta do some work on this. Now, back to what we were talking about. Um, what is this? It says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Uh, first, we have to understand what it is. Um, when it is in the holy place, the abomination of desolation. What will this be? Now, one thing I didn't bring up on Sunday uh, to try not to confuse everybody too much. Did you know that the abomination of the desolation has kind of already happened? Oh no, brother, are you now a preterist? AD 70, it happened in AD 70? No, I'm not a preterist. But one thing about Bible prophecy that I, it makes it even more thrilling than ever is layer upon layer, um, there is a thing called dual fulfillment of prophecy. And um, there are times in the Bible where we see things happen that are predicted and more than once. And probably the greatest example of that is with this idea of the abomination of desolation. And, um, and here's how we know this is a, a sort of a precursor to the abomination of desolation. Daniel talks about this and he talks about an event that actually happened around, well, I'm not even gonna say, does anybody know what is the pre-foretelling, uh, foreshadowing of the real abomination that's gonna happen in the book of Revelation at the tribulation period? What's the historical event that people say was sort of 1.0 abomination? Antiochus Epiphanes, the Maccabean revolt. Remember this? Daniel talks about this in great detail. Remember when, uh, the, if you remember, you know, after Alexander the Great took Jerusalem, um, you know, and he, con and he conquered the world, but he took Jerusalem sort of peacefully, kind of shockingly, and that, that's because, well, I'm not gonna get into that, but um, that's a whole other thing in history, it's amazing. But, um, but after he took that, you know, shortly after he conquered the world, he died. At the age of 33, no more worlds for him to conquer, and Alexander died. But. Um, who took over after Alexander? It was these four generals that they divvied up the whole world, kingdoms that he had conquered to these uh, four generals. Uh, what was it, Lysimachus, uh, Cassander, um, Ptolemy and Seleucus. Those were the four generals. Um, but two of those generals were perhaps really important as it relates to Bible and prophecy. The Ptolemy and the Seleucid group um, they, they were, uh, the Ptolemies were down in, in Egypt below Israel. The Seleucids were up more like in Assyria in the northern area. Um, and they, they didn't get along. They, they went uh, brutal wars between the Ptolemies and Seleucids. The, the bummer for that is Israel was the speed bump between them. 
And the, the wars raged over Israel and really demolished Israel by and large. And, uh, but one of the things, right around 168 uh, um, BC, uh, one of the uh, Seleucid leaders, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, as he was called, uh, took over Jerusalem, killed tens of thousands, some say over a million Jews. Um, and that's, he's, the, he's the guy that smeared pig's blood all over the temple in Jerusalem, made the priests drink pig's blood, defiling the temple, and setting up a, a, a statue in the temple to be worshiping basically him. Um, in fact, the, the name Antiochus Epiphanes was basically him saying, I'm pretty much God. Um, now the Jews had a nickname for this guy <laughs> because uh, he was so horrible. Um, he, he, they called, they did a play on words, uh, and I'm going to do probably bad justice to this, but they, his name Antiochus Epiphanes, they called him Antiochus Epimanes, which was a little twist of the word that meant Antiochus the madman. Um, I think the other one was Antiochus like the splendid or the gl glorious, uh, but they said, no, he's Antiochus, um, uh, Antiochus Epimanes, the madman. And well, he killed one of the priests on the temple steps. And if you remember, the priest's sons uh, was, were these SEAL Team 6 guys. Uh, remember them? Uh, the Maccabees. The Maccabean revolt happened and they took over Jerusalem from Antiochus and uh, you know, took back Jerusalem. And that's the whole Hanukkah story when they relit the lights in the temple uh, there in Jerusalem and they burned even though they didn't have an oil. Uh, that's what Hanukkah is. And Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, by the way, if you didn't know that, the Bible tells us that. Jesus actually was there on the Temple Mount um, when they were celebrating the Festival of Lights uh, from that time, from 168 BC to 172-ish, 172 172-ish uh, 172 to 168, um, that time period. And that's when, by the way, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, which, boy, all the pieces, don't you love how all the pieces kind of come together when you read the Bible? But you say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, um, that was Daniel talking about the abomination of desolation when he talked about Antiochus coming in and defiling the temple in Jerusalem. Well, you say, well, Brett, maybe that's what Jesus was talking about. But you gotta remember, that was 168 years before Jesus was on the scene. And Jesus is talking about something that's in the future. When you see what Daniel spoke of in the abomination of desolation in the future. So this is where we know, and by the way, when Daniel talks about Antiochus, it follows the Seleucid story and the, the whole thing perfectly. And then suddenly there's a shifting of gears uh, when Daniel, like Daniel chapter 11, he's talking about this Antiochus of Iphanes guy and he's like, you're following it along. And then all of a sudden the narrative shifts to something that's more global and someone who's even more sinister than Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes is a type or a picture of the coming Antichrist that's gonna be on the scene during the tribulation period. Did I just confuse everybody a whole lot? Some of you are giving me some very scary stares. It's like, what did you do? Um, no, it's, it's actually pretty fascinating, but it's all part of this great uh, picture that the Lord has painted for us about what's gonna happen in the tribulation period, specifically the, the abomination of desolation. Now, the, the image that Antiochus put in there was to, like a statue of, of an idol, but the Bible tells us that this coming world leader is gonna set himself up to be um, worshiped. And, and so when it says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, stand in the holy place. Um, uh, that's, that's this idea of an image of some kind um, where uh, whether it's a statue or whatever, it's gonna be something that he's gonna demand to be worshiped. We have a sort of a commentary on this in Revelation 13. Why don't you keep your finger here and go with me to Revelation 13. In the book of Revelation 13, we're, uh, we're there in the middle of the tribulation. Revelation 6 through 19 talks about the tribulation period, the seven year period. And as, as you're more in the middle of the tribulation, you find yourself in chapter 13. Um, and by the way, the word antichrist, um, he, uh, he's called in the Bible the Assyrian, the lawless one, the beast, son of perdition. There's all these names, so keep that in mind. But um, he's also gonna be a broker of peace with Israel. It's gonna seem great until this point in the tribulation where he sort of reveals himself to be sort of a wacko uh, you know, person. And we start in verse um, Revelation, uh, where am I here? 
Oh, I was in the wrong chapter. Revelation 13, 13. It says, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Uh, pause there for a second. Just because someone does miracles doesn't make them good. Do you know that? That's important to know. Just because someone seems to be doing miracles or even if they are doing miracles, I would say, um, that doesn't make them good. There's, there's kind of a notion, well, if they're doing miracles, it must be great. Um, and, um, and we approve things that are sort of seemingly magical. I think that's a, a mistake. Um, I love what Matthew 16, 17, pardon me, Mark 16, 17 says, you know, and these signs and wonders will follow them that believe. And in my name, they'll cast out devils and speak with new tongues. But the idea of, of the, the Christian, we should not be following after signs and wonders. That's an important thing to know. Because that can very much mislead you, especially uh, if you're not a believer in the tribulation period. Uh, we're gonna be in heaven, but there's gonna be people that'll be deceived because guess what? This coming world leader is gonna be doing seemingly wondrous things uh, and he will deceive them, verse 14. Um, he's gonna bring fire down from heaven, it seems. Um, and, and then verse 14, and he will deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound um, by the sword and did live. If you read through this whole thing, the, the beast is gonna have a wound, it's gonna seem to die, but he's gonna come back to life. Does that sound like somebody's trying to be a poser real quick? Uh, you know, he, the devil is a, is a deceiver and he's a poser and an imposter. And he always tries to mimic um, you know, uh, what Jesus did. He died on the cross, rose from the grave. He's like, oh, I could do that. And so that's what he's gonna do. And he's gonna deceive people. Um, but as it turns out, he's gonna make this image, verse 14. That's an interesting uh, thing here. Uh, and he's gonna set it in the temple. You might jot 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 uh, next to that. Uh, make an image to the beast, which had a, the wound by the sword and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he'll cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, uh, that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or his number of his name, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. This is a description of this abomination of desolation where he's gonna set up an image, and, and we know from other passages he's gonna do that in the temple, in Jerusalem. But what's interesting is this language about this image, it's gonna seem to come to life, um, and it's gonna have the power both to speak and to cause um, as many as would not worship the image, they would then kill the person who says, I'm not gonna worship that. And um, so it, may, it does make one wonder, you know, what is this image of this beast that talks? <laughs> and um, and you, you kind of have to wonder, you know, this Antichrist is gonna have this wound, he's gonna have possible maybe assassination attempt, you can only speculate, uh, but he'll seem to come back to life um, and by the way, the word life there in, in Revelation uh, chapter 13, verse 15, when it says he had the power to give life unto the image, the word life there, you, you, you uh, students of the word might be uh, surprised to know the word life is pneuma in the Greek text, which is about like the Holy Spirit. Um, it's the, um, the pneuma, the, the breath to breathe life into something. Um, and he's gonna seem to have the ability to breathe life into something that's not alive. Um, that, that's an interesting thing as we live in a culture that's, have you seen how they're trying to bring back the dodo bird? Um, you know, now that we have the, they say, you know, we have the DNA of a dodo bird and, and the fully, fur, furry woolly mammoth, they said we'll have a real fully, furry woolly mammoth. Even though they're extinct now, they're gonna be bringing back to life, um, which is not the same thing. But we've, that's one thing science hasn't been able to replicate, bringing something to life that was not alive to begin with. Um, we can mess with genetic codes, but we still need the, the life that's already in something to, to have something come to life. We, we can't duplicate that. This will seemingly replicate that. 
Um, now, th this, this re brings all kinds of interesting questions, especially if you've been playing around with things like chat GPT, like I mentioned at the Prophecy Update. Um, uh, people are a little weirded out because it almost has a life of its own. It's AI, artificial intelligence. And if you haven't heard about that, I talked about it in the last two Prophecy Updates. Uh, Microsoft, it's only been out for a couple months, the, this particular technology, and Microsoft already has paid $10 billion for it. Um, uh, which is, means probably something is coming up there that's uh, uh, sort of important, <laughs> but we'll see. But, um, you know, it, it's stuff you can play with now. It's just sort of a toy. You can go to chat P GPT and write sermons. I don't do that. I did it for the Prophecy Update, and I read my first, uh, you know, introduction to Prophecy Update on Friday night, and then I stopped and said, now everything I just said was not me. It was chat GPT uh, writing a sermon for me. And it's shocking because um, you, you'd say, well, Brett, that sounds like what you would have said. And the question I said, write an essay on the, uh, Matthew chapter 24 uh, from a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial viewpoint. And it wrote an amazing sermon, an uh, essay on how, uh, now, I promise you, I'm not gonna do that. That's ridiculous. I'm sure there's pastors who will. Uh, how, why write a sermon when a, 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 a GPT could do it for you? Uh, I joke, I'm joking. I have to say that because some people online, you'll be, he said he's writing sermons. Anyway, uh, but, but what, what's really weird about that is uh, they're questioning, does this thing start to have a consciousness because it's not just pulling like Google, a bunch of things that have already been written together and making a list for you, it's creating. That's the thing that's shocking about this AI. It's taking text that's out there in the world and, and information and, and um, sort of integrating information to create something totally new. That's why, that's why students are now writing their term papers uh, with chat GPT and it's better than they could write. And, um, and there's no way for a prof to go and say, oh, I think this is plagiarized because if he goes and searches that, it's brand new. Every time a student does that in 10 seconds, he can have his term paper uh, already with spell check and everything and it's, it's great. Uh, but you say, oh, so what? But it's all the other stuff it can do. It can write code. If you're, if you're writing code and you've got an error in your code, you can put it in there and say, fix my code. I don't know what the problem is. And chat, or you know, the, this AI will go in and fix your code for you. Um, it, it knows how to learn and fix and repair. And, uh, like it, and it can draw, it can create music. Um, there's musicians now that'll play a few chords with their guitar of their style of music and then say, write a record about the various, uh, you know, uh, spring, summer, uh, winter, uh, fall, and write uh, 12 songs with my guitar style uh, and make a whole record. And they've made whole records now uh, that are artificial intelligence. And you'd be shocked how good it is. Um, and no, they didn't borrow some of these songs, it's creating. So what, what we're seeing with this AI, and then if you put that in conjunction with what's happening with robotics, um, did you see the construction worker robot, Boston Dynamics, that, that runs around and grabs the tool bags and jumps up on the scaffolding and climbs up and then throws the toolbox up and then runs off and does a gainer off the, and then lands on the ground and is like ready to go. Like um, robots are, are getting better. And then this, this artificial intelligence, the creators of this are saying, all we need is 1.9 gigabytes to make this artificial intelligence actually work, which you guys that are in computers know that's nothing. 1.9 gigabyte, your, you know, your phone has tons of that, you know, and let alone the little tiny chip that they might put in your, in your forehead or in your wrist. Um, and, and there's a conjunction here with this, those that worship the image will have the ch something. And, and if your newer translation says on their right hand or on their forehead, that's incorrect. The Greek word for that is the preposition in in their forehead or in their right hand. Shocking, but not for us in modern days. We all, oh, yeah, it could be some version of some chip that functions in conjunction. At World Economic Forum just last, a couple weeks ago, um, the um, supervillain, uh, Klaus Schwab, said, if, can you imagine in 10 years when we'll have this chip implanted in our brains? Uh, and then he talked about how we'll all interact and you'll know what I'm, you'll know what, you, I'll know what you're thinking about what I'm talking about because we'll be this great community of, and I'm like, mm. <laughs> doesn't sound very fun to me <laughs> uh, being in Klaus Schwab's brain. But be that as it may, they're, they're saying this technology is like just a few years away and this chat GPT thing is showing how fast it's moving. Um, could it be 
that the abomination of desolation is gonna be some highly integrated system too. Not only the, the Babylonian, uh, uh, you know, when you read Revelation 17 and 18, the ancient mystery Babylon religion that's gonna be brought up, but it's gonna be an economic Babylon, a religious Babylon. There's gonna be um, this global uh, movement, globalism, and it's gonna be all kind of around this one world leader. And, and if you don't follow this one leader, then you will be killed. That's what the Bible says about this. Now you say, Brett, what, what are you, why are you getting all this stuff? Well, I think we've seen a lot of, in the last two, three years, we've seen some of the test balloons going up about how to control the world, how to bring the world into a, a, a place of unity or globalism or new world order or whatever you wanna call it. And what they're playing around with right now, a lot of the stuff they're playing around with right now is I believe perhaps the early precursors to the control we're reading about in Revelation 13. Um, and so again, rather than going, oh, the world's going crazy. No, it's, it's all falling into place exactly like the Lord said it would. So um, what will this image be? Well, it's called an abomination. And by the way, in the Bible, idolatry is always referred to abomination. It's called the abomination of desolation. So abomination is the idol worship part, but the desolation is always the result of idol worship. And that's what's gonna happen. The abomination of desolation there in verse, verse 15. Um, uh, supernatural miracle will be done. Uh, will it be a, some robotic holographic image or something that seems to have been brought back to life? Who knows? But we have the technology. It's, it, we've been speculating on this for you know 50 years. Um, but it's gotten so uh, close to where we could realize what would happen here. Uh, it's kind of shocking how close we are to that stuff. But if you don't worship this image, you'll be killed. Verses 16 through 18 talks about the economic system. Um, so there'll be a worshiping, whatever this Antichrist sets up, you have to worship it, and that's the only way you'll be able to buy or sell, which is the only way you'll be able to exist. Now, back to Matthew 24, this is what Jesus is talking about. The same thing Revelation 13 is talking about, the same thing Daniel chapter nine was talking about. It's all throughout the Bible, this abomination of desolation that Jesus is referring to. So when that happens, uh, what do you do? Uh, if you're a Jew living in the tribulation period, Jesus gives instruction. Verse 16, he says, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his, uh, take, take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, to them that give suck or are nursing in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall great tribulation be, such as was not since the first, or the beginning of the world, to this time, nor uh, no, nor ever shall be. Now, um, verses uh, you know, 15 through 21, Jesus is saying, when the, hap the abomination of desolation happens, here's what you do. And, and the first thing you notice is urgency. He, it's like Jesus saying, if you're a Jew, because he says that, those of you that are in Judea, Judea, Jerusalem, that's... And by the way, when we went over Daniel's 70 weeks there in uh, Daniel chapter nine, I remember it was, it's funny because you can almost see how Jesus is talking specifically to the Jews here, as was Daniel's prophecy. Remember Gabriel said to Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city, uh, Jerusalem. And Jesus is really picking up where Daniel left off here. He's saying all of you that are in Judea, the Jews is who he's talking to. He says, basically run for your life when this happens, when the abomination of desolation happens. Now, if you know the book of Daniel, here's why. Uh, Jesus doesn't really get into the why, but what's, what's, once the Antichrist does this abomination, what's he gonna do right after that, anybody? Right, somebody said it, make war. In fact, uh, Daniel tells us the, the Antichrist has his own worship, his own religion, and it's weapons. The Antichrist will worship weaponry and munitions is the, the, the word that we actually get from the Hebrew word there. Um, and, it's, um, and it's gonna be, he's gonna make war against the Jews like no other time in history. You know, uh, 
talk about precursor and foreshadowing what um, Adolf Hitler did in World War II, wanting to exterminate the Jews. Um, he'll look like Mr. Rogers compared to the Antichrist, who's gonna want to just wipe out the Jews. He's gonna make war against the Jews, and also he'll make war against anyone, the tribulation saints, anyone who refuses to take his mark. But he's gonna have a specific uh, thing, according to the book of Daniel, he's gonna speak powerful or orations of words of intellect and words of power and convince the world of things. He's, in fact, the Bible tells us this coming world leader is gonna have kind of the, um, a likability. You know, maybe like some of the great, you know, um, world leaders in history, he's gonna have all kinds of likability. Maybe he'll be as likable as Ronald Reagan. Uh, maybe he'll have, you know, dip diplomatic skills, uh, you know, of a Winston Churchill and tactical, uh, you know, like, uh, like he's gonna be a, a kind of an amazing guy so that the world's gonna fall for him, but it'll be the abomination of desolation that Jesus is talking about, that Daniel talked about, where the Jews will realize, run for your lives. So he says, man, don't even go back to your house to get stuff. Run for your lives. If you're, pray. He says, pray that it's not in the winter time because that'll make it harder. Pray that it be not on the Sabbath day. Now this, this sort of echoes back. Do you guys remember the Yom Kippur War or, or at least reading about it in history? Some of you are old enough to remember the Yom Kippur War. But um, what made the Yom Kippur War so interesting was the Arab nations that attacked Israel on that day was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Most holy day in Jewish you know, uh, practice. And on Yom Kippur, it's, it's considered like a massive Sabbath day. Um, and the reason the Arabs chose to attack on the Jews' most holy day wasn't just to kind of spite the Jews, probably was, they were happy to do that too, but it was mainly because Israel shuts everything down on the Sabbath. Do you understand that? When you go to Israel with us, it's actually a bummer. We have to find very Gentile things to do on those days because everything's closed. Uh, sometimes we try to, to go on the Sabbath day, there's a, there's a tank base that I've become friends with some of the people there. And, and, um, and you know, we, we did a bunch of Jewish things during, but on the Sabbath day, the tank base is still open. So we go and look at tanks and the guys thank me for that, uh, for all the shopping we did. We, I say, guys, hang in there. You'll say tanks a lot when we go see this. <laughs> and we go see all these tanks, uh, the Mercurva 4, which is an amazing tank. Anyway, um, but, but it's funny, even, you know, the buses stop running, the flights, you know, that was in Yom Kippur, everything stopped. The TV stations shut down, the radios stopped broadcast, like, like everything shuts down, uh, even to this day. So Yom Kippur, when it happened, the Arab nations attacked and the Jews, they didn't even know what was going on because nobody's watching TV, nobody's listening to the radio. Um, does anybody remember how did the Arab government or the Israeli government get the attention of the nation and say, wake up, we got something going on? They flew these jets through Jerusalem at supersonic speed and it broke windows out of, of people's houses. The sonic boom as the jets went through Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and all these cities broke out bunches of the windows because they, they said, well, everybody get your weapons, check in for, you know, because they're a... They're a, a Civil, uh, their military is largely made up of their, their whole people group. So they, they all went to war and of course, uh, miraculously defeated the Arab nations that attacked them ruthlessly on their Yom Kippur day. It's an amazing war to study. But that was kind of a precursor to what Jesus is talking about when he says, um, pray that it not be on the Sabbath day because the Jews really do, even to this day, even though they're largely unbelieving, they still pretty much shut everything down on the Sabbath day. Um, so interesting words that Jesus says here, it all fits perfectly. And so he says, uh, really, you gotta run for your life. And, um, and, it, and it says, flee there into the mountains. Um, now, uh, again, I'm sorry that I'm bouncing around so much, but I'm wanting to, you to connect some of the dots because the same thing is talked about in Revelation 12. Keep your finger here. Flip over to Revelation chapter 12. Remember on Sunday, I was telling you how the book of Revelation talks about the three and a half years, the first half and the last half of the seven year period. This is one of those sections. Uh, but it says in Revelation 12, 12. Therefore, rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. By the way, who's in heaven during the tribulation period? 
Rejoice, O heavens. That's us. We're up there. Uh, rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon, which is the devil, by the way, saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which he brought forth, which brought forth the man-child. Now, I'm gonna do the quick uh, interpretation of this. The woman is Israel, the man-child is Jesus, the Messiah. Um, then it says, and to the woman, Israel, verse 14, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she will be nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. Now, what's a time, times, and a half time? Anybody? Right, it's an idiom of this, you know, uh, people group that you'd say a time, meaning a year, times, meaning two years, and a half time. So it's three and a half years. It's, it's the way they would put that. Uh, so three and a half years, and verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Now, what that is, I have no idea. What's the devil gonna pour out to the Jews? Because this is all talking about the abomination of desolation, the woman is gonna um, be attacked, like Daniel says, ferociously, but some kind of flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood, verse 15. In verse 16, the earth helped the woman and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So somehow here, Antichrist with some of his munitions and weapons is gonna attack the Jews as they're trying to flee but somehow the earth is gonna help the woman. Um, how is that gonna, I just don't know. Uh, could it be, it could be that the earth absorbs some uh, radioactive fallout material and some, uh, it could be something l literal, but it could be something massively miraculous. Remember when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rebelled against Moses and Moses said, okay, everybody step aside and the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and closed over them and then burped, eh, and then, well, I made up the burp part, but. Remember the earth story? Swallowing Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Like, maybe it's something like that, where it's just this miraculous, you know, geological event that helps the woman. The earth helped the woman and opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Verse 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which uh, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this is an interesting description uh, of really what Jesus is talking about. Back to Matthew 24, the, the woman's gonna flee. Um, where is she gonna flee? Um, verse 16 of Matthew 24, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, if you're in Jerusalem, you're already in the mountains. So what mountains do you flee to? Well, the nearest mountains to Jerusalem from there are the mountains of Moab and Edom, uh, directly to the east. And, um, and we actually know which mountains they're gonna flee to um, because of, um, of other passages. We know that um, this is gonna happen in a place around or near or at a place called Petra. Um, that's why it's fun to go to Petra. Uh, you know, it's, it's a real challenge if you got a tour group to get across the border from Israel to the country of Jordan. And when you cross the border, you're, you know you ain't in Kansas anymore. Like Israel is kind of a, you know, like being in Oregon. It's, Israel is a very modern, very comfortable, amazing place to be. And as soon as you cross the border into Jordan, you're, you're in a third world country. And it's, it's definitely, a, a, it's really a good experience for our people I've found to go into Jordan. We all get sick and barf and because the, there's bacteria. And it's great, you'll have a wonderful time there. <laughs> the last time. We had a few people get sick there from Jordan, but um, it was worth it because we got to hike through this place. If you look in this picture, way off in the distance, see the little white tip of that mountain off in the distance? That's called Aaron's tomb right there. Um, and that's where they believe Aaron was buried. It's that region, this is near the region where Moses looked over Israel. But this is that place in Jordan on the mountains uh, across the Jordan Valley, across into the country of Jordan. Um, and this place, Petra, is, is an incredible place. Um, it was really carved out of this natural seek. This, this, you walk a, a couple miles down through this crack 
Uh, and eventually, as you go through this, it's, it's breathtaking. Like the pictures don't even do it in justice. But when you come through the final crack of this seek, you come to the, the lost city of Petra. And the Nabataeans carved out these facades. Uh, and um, and uh, they're just incredible. It's, it's an incredible place. Maybe you recognize this um, you know, from a movie that you saw, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, or, or Indiana Jones' Last Crusade, um, Aladdin, the live action, Transformers, they all tried to film stuff here because it's, it's kind of an amazing set. But what's interesting about it is you still have to kind of hike into it. It's hard to get to. It takes time to tour through it. Um, we hike about 13 miles in one morning uh, when we're going through this place. Uh, uh, and you can get a chariot if you want to. Uh, but these are all the tombs carved in the mountains, the hillsides. Uh, it's incredible. It's an inc- I did a sermon right there to you guys last time I was there and broadcasted it back from that cliff looking out over Petra. But um, th- some of this is the Roman ruins. After the Nabataeans, the Romans conquered the Nabataeans and came and built Romans, Roman buildings and stuff. But then you do a further hike through this giant valley and you come to this place called the uh, treasure, or pardon me, the, the, the monastery. And if you'll, um, if you'll see, there's people standing in the door there. <laughs> uh, it's, this thing is massive. Uh, it's so huge. Uh, that you, like, see the person standing in the doorway? That, that's how big that doorway is. Uh, it's just massive. Um, but the reason I show you all these pictures, it's because um, this is a massive, huge area where um, the Bible indicates that the Jews are gonna flee when Antichrist uh, makes war against them. And you say, well, what's this place gonna do? We have bombs and airplanes and stuff. Don't know, but it seems the Bible's gonna, the Jews are gonna flee here and the Lord's gonna protect them miraculously in this place we, we would call Petra. Um, there's pla- places in the Bible that tell us about that. Isaiah 16, uh, jot this down in your notes. Isaiah 16, verses one through five, talks about you know, that time where the, the lamb, Israel, is gonna be sent to the wilderness of Moab out of Zion and be cast out uh, and, uh, and basically Moab would be the place where they would find refuge. Uh, you know, Isaiah talks about it and they call the, the, another name for this is Selah or Petra, Selah. It might even be near or around Basra, a few Bible prophecy people. Uh, Basra comes into the discussion very much in the second coming of Christ uh, and rescuing his people. And he's gonna come from Basra with blood on his garments, with a sickle. Remember that whole thing? This is all tied in with this, this region called Petra. And by the way, I probably don't have time to go into this, but uh, um, it was, uh, nobody believed the, the place Petra even existed. It was like the lost city of Atlantis. People talked about this glorious city of Petra, um, but nobody believed it was real. But there was this one guy in 1812 uh, Johann Ludwig Berthardt, who uh, believed that it did exist. And so he, he dressed up like an Arab guy and he lived down in that region and he just tried to get, get in on the information on the inside. And there was a group of people that worshiped Aaron. Um, and uh, and they, they had a special place that only people that worshiped Aaron could go and they wouldn't let anybody else there uh, with, you know, in 1812. Well, Burkhart came and said, I want to worship Aaron. And he, he learned kind of the secret passage, passcode. And so in 1812, th- their own religion said, well, if he wants to worship Aaron, we have to let him in. So they let Burkhart in, this British guy, uh, Johann Ludwig Burkhart. And he brought in, by the way, a um, interesting artist who gave us the first sketches of Petra. You can buy those online because they're amazing drawings of everything that I just showed you uh, that we were walking through and seeing. But, um, Anyway, uh, it was just kind of fun as, you know, if you, can you imagine being a Christian reading your Bible in 1812 and knowing that there's this p- place called Petra that the Jews are gonna flee to and most people say, yeah, it doesn't really even exist. But in 1812, they figured out, oh, it really does exist and it's huge. Um, this is the place that I believe the, the Bible through uh, the book of uh, Revelation, um, Isaiah the prophet, they all talk about Petra, Selah being the place where the Jews will flee. Well, We're running out of time. Back to uh, Matthew 24. Jesus said they'll flee into the mountains. That's the mountains of Moab and Edom, uh, which is Jordan and probably specifically Petra. Um, Notice something here. Remember when I told you the preterists believe that uh, Matthew 24 uh, has already happened 
and um, it's already been fulfilled. You can just check it off. I already showed you a few things of why that's not possible uh, last Sunday. Um, but here's another one. Jesus in verse 21, when we read that, it says, for then shall such great, shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. AD 70 was a bummer. It was horrible. Um, in, in fact, uh, Josephus says that 1.1 million Jews were killed on AD 70 by the Romans. So yes, horrible, horrible thing. But question, was that the worst thing that ever happened in the world ever since then? Not even close. Man, we could talk about all kinds of things that happened that were just horrific. I mean, brutal, grotesque slaughtering of people throughout the ages. And even if you want to specifically say for the Jews, we can know that Hitler killed six million Jews in the, in, in the concentration camps. I mean, it was way worse than AD 70. So um, those that believe this is already fulfilled, that, that makes Jesus wrong here. Um, to say that the, the last part of the tribulation period is the worst thing that will ever happen ever and ever will be in the world. Um, just, that's just not true. That's not what happened. Um, so those that say this has already happened, I, I, I say you should maybe change your notes on that one because we can provably show Jesus was wrong if you believe this has already uh, been fulfilled. I'm not willing to say that. I think Jesus is talking about a future event that is yet to happen and it's called the abomination of desolation and it's the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And the rest of the Bible supports that. Are you guys starting to see the arguments here of how Matthew 24 is not something that's already history and happened? I hope you're seeing that. It's pretty obvious to me. Well, we move on there in verse 22. Um, it says, um, and notice the word elect in this next section. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The disciples asked Jesus here at the beginning of this chapter, um, you know, uh, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus says, oh, you wanna know my sign? Well, first of all, don't be deceived. There's gonna be a bunch of people. And implication, he's already in the tribulation period here, talking about the abomination of desolation. And I believe it's during that time, there's gonna be people saying, I am the Christ. I am the second coming. Uh, meet me in the desert over here. And Jesus said, don't go to that dude. He's not the Christ. Well, how will we know? Jesus is kind of saying, you'll know. You'll know the Christ because it's like, have you ever seen lightning go from the east part of the sky all the way to the west? If you've seen that, that's kind of how the second coming is gonna be, <laughs> which speaks of quickness and power. And maybe, have you ever had lightning bolt across like that and have the sound of the thunder and the lightning at the same time? It feels like it's crushing your head. If you've ever, there's, Oregon doesn't have that kind of lightning and thunder. Have you ever noticed that? But uh, I've, I've been in places uh, like Africa uh, where, um, man, lightning just feels like it's right on your head. Or even in New Orleans, one time my family and I, we were out standing outside by the car and all of a sudden just boom, and you could feel the hair on your head stand up and light just flash. And you're like, wow, that was really close. And we all kind of <laughs> like, whoo, a little shaky there. But that's just, that's what it's gonna be like, you'll know. But don't be sucked into the false, uh, you know, Christ so-called, uh, as they're called here. Four, verse 28, for uh, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Um, now, some of you might be going, oh, how wonderful eagles, that's so great, God bless America. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> I told you there in, in uh, um, the story in Revelation, it says that the Jews will be carried by a great eagle. Uh, into the wilderness. Uh, some people say, well, that's America. America's coming to the rescue of the Jews during the tribulation. We're gonna carry them out of Jerusalem and put them there. Uh, that'd be great, but uh, no, 
That's not what it's, that's probably not what it's talking about. Uh, what is the great eagle? Boy, there's, there's a lot of things we could talk about that, don't have time tonight. But uh, I'm just gonna say, I don't think it's America. And if you think, well, here's America right here, because there's eagles around. Uh, 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 they're gathered together. Well, I'm sorry to burst the bubble, but cross out the word eagle, because uh, that's just wrong. Um, and as it turns out, the word is literally uh, a vulture. Um, uh, the, word, the word is aetos, uh, or et, et, etos, which means vulture. Um, uh, and uh, I, I always like to talk about when I went to Africa, this is, this is actually uh, some pictures I took years and years ago, but I was getting ready for dinner and I got a picture of this guy, uh, both these guys. They were like five feet from where the ladies were preparing our dinner. They're just kind of hopping around. The one on the corner of this, he was literally like four feet away from the ladies that were you know, cooking our goat head soup uh, that had eyeballs, goat eyeballs and stuff in it. And I was just getting ready to eat that. And I was watching that guy kind of going, I want some goat eyeballs and stuff. So I took a picture of that, but th this is what the Bible is talking about. Um, why would these guys be gathered together during this time? Um, they're gonna go for dinner. It's gonna be a feast and it's gonna be food. Um, uh, again, I I'm sorry to bounce you around. We're almost done tonight, but flip over to Revelation 19 real quick uh, and let's review because Jesus is about to, in Matthew 24, he's about to show us um, uh, the second coming of Christ but in Matthew 9, or Revelation 19, um, I read the whole second coming part last Sunday, so I'm not gonna go into all of that. But after Jesus comes, verse 16 of chapter 19, um, he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls, that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Um, this, this is the vultures that we're just reading about in Matthew 24. That you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses, them that sit on the flesh and the both all men, both free and bond, small and great. Um, and then it goes on and talks about the feast uh, or the, the beast and the false prophet and their doom. So this is the end, this is, we're getting really close to the end of the beast, the Antichrist, and the end of Satan, or at least for now. But that's what Jesus is talking about here. The, the birds, back to Matthew 24, the eagles are the vultures. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens that be shaken. Now pause for a second. He's about to talk about the second coming. And when is the second coming? It's after the tribulation period. Again, if you're a preterist, you're saying that the tribulation happened in AD 70, and Jesus said immediately after the tribulation shall those, and then he's gonna talk about the second coming. So they've missed the, the nuance here that's pretty obvious to me. So he says, as soon as the tribulation of those days are over, it says the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That seems global to me, not Jerusalem only. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And verse 31, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to another. Um, I asked you to notice the word elect. It's there in verse 31, verse 30, 24, verse 22. Um, and people get confused by this, but the elect in the Bible is three main groups. The first group is the Jews. They're God's elect. I hope you know that. Um, and uh, the elect of God, uh, by the way, the word elect, it just, it's because it denotes determined beforehand, like we elect a US president, uh, theoretically. Uh, we, we choose that, uh, the people that serve in an office. Um, but uh, the elect in the Bible is Christians, Jews, and the tribulation saints. The Jews are, are the elect, they're called that. Um, even uh, there in Isaiah 45, four, you can jot that down. For Jacob is my, ser my servant and Israel is mine elect. It's, it's clear. Um, Isaiah 65, nine talks about Israel being the elect. 
Romans 11, 28 says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as for touching the election, they are beloved of the Father's sakes. So the Jews are God's elect, but also the church. Anybody who's been chosen by God, we're called elect. And then in the tribulation, both Jews and people that accept Christ during the tribulation are also part of what I would call the elect. And that's who's being gathered in verse 31. The tribulation saints, um, uh, there in verse 31, he shall set his angels with a trumpet, gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the uh, heaven to the other. So there you have it. I, I know we, we're going slowly through this chapter, but do you kind of get a sense that this is kind of a, a weighty thing that we should probably know about? Because I think this is something that's in the near future. And uh, it's something that we should really not be ignorant of. The Bible tells us that over and over again. So I appreciate your patience as we're just moseying through Matthew here. Um, the question I wanna ask you as we leave is, what's the fig tree of verse 32? And, um, and what is, who are the people in verse 40 who are uh, in, a, in a field, one's taken and one's left? That's the question I want you to mull over and we'll tackle that perhaps sometime next week. Uh, in Jesus' name, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would uh, sharpen us, uh, that we would continue just to receive your word. And um, we're just so thankful that we have the best commentary on your word, um, the word itself, that we can look to Revelation, Daniel, Isaiah, the prophets, and see this um, integrated message system um, that is meant to be uh, searched and discovered. And I pray that you'd give us understanding of these things, Lord. And for the stuff we don't understand, we just commit that to you, Lord. We're thankful that you uh, show us in your timing uh, to have understanding of your word. So Lord, protect this group from being frustrated, from not knowing all the details. Uh, well, Lord, we, have, we all have so much to learn and I pray that we just be patient as we search the scriptures to see what it teaches, Lord. May it bring good fruit in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.